Well, hello, Tipton Baptist. Welcome to your Bible study time this week, uh, the week of March 10, 2021. I'm excited to be back in our Bible study moment here with you. We're going to be back in Matthew chapter 5, uh, where the Beatitudes were being taught by Christ in his Sermon on the Mount. Today we're going to be looking at uh, Matthew 5, 4. So turn with me, if you will. We'll go ahead and pray. We'll ask God to give us wisdom and insight into his word in this one verse. Take a moment to study it and then find some ways to apply it today. So as you're turning there, just bow with me and let's ask God's blessing. Heavenly Father, we thank you for being good to us and giving us your word. We thank you that you, when you were here, Lord Jesus, that you spoke and you taught. And that the things that you taught back then, not only were principles for the people then, but they are for us now. That we might find our contentment in you, our, our hope in you. Uh, that we might have joy because of you and your teaching and what you've said. And the promises that you've made and that you've kept. So God, please bless us as we are reading this. Bless us with a sense of, of communion with you. Bless us, Lord, we ask with a, a sense of insight as to your meanings and to understand uh, what it means to be a person who is blessed or happy in ways that you say. So we ask that you'll give us a desire for happiness that you give over all other happinesses. And may that be our pursuit uh, so that we are pursuing you and solely you. Uh, I thank you for the chance to be in the Bible with the folks at Tipton. We as the church, Lord, ask for your blessing on our church with a desire for you in your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So here we go, Matthew 5, 4. <clears throat> we begin with the verse itself, very short but sweet. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. <clears throat> it was John Owen who said, I do not understand how a man can be a true believer in whom sin is not the greatest burden sorrow, and trouble. His statement was true in the 17th century as much as it is today. It's hard to think really, biblically speaking, it's hard to think how a true believer is not troubled and burdened in one who is sorrowful, even mourning over sin. Uh, John Owen's statement and, and his, his uh, insistency to dig into the Word, to see how God does come and He meets people who sin, who are children of His, uh, his teaching and his digging in the scripture can be helpful even all these years later. So I chose to use his quote to start us off. Certainly, though, his quote highlights something. Burdens and sorrows are something that Christians, at least at times, should feel, specifically because of sin. Uh, times of mourning are not a fun thing. Uh, burdens and sorrows in and of themselves, they're not a fun thing. Mourning results from loss and pain and affliction, and, and we've all mourned the loss of some things, big things and small things, materially even. Um, lost time in the past, and difficult, painful times in the present. We've mourned these things. Uh, we've mourned broken relationships, and even death of loved ones. We, we mourn at times, and mourning is something that when we see it mentioned in the verse by Jesus, we understand mourning. Uh, it's not a fun thing. Mourning and grief are woven together. I think that's the way it's meant to be, although it's not something that we want to invite. That's for sure. Jesus had words here for those who mourn, and his teaching leaves us with much to think about. The perspective heard in Jesus' words, as always, where we're going is finding the perspective Jesus had as he taught. Let's look at the verse again together. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. While the initial thought that comes to the reader is focused on the good, or the, for they shall be comforted, the first and most simple implication here is that there are people, there are those who are in need of comfort. There are people who mourn. And the way Jesus is speaking, is speaking here, there are people who will not mourn. Blessed are those who mourn. Not blessed are all people because all people mourn. It's not what he said. He's speaking as if there are those who will mourn, and by implication there are those who might not mourn. Ones who mourn will be blessed. Ones who do not mourn will not be blessed. Again, that term blessed can translate into English happy. Ones who mourn will be happy. Happy are those who mourn. They will be comforted. But happy are those who mourn if you're not mourning in the sense that he's speaking of, you might see that you won't be happy. And this doesn't seem to make sense if we really think about it. What is this perspective here of this mourning that Jesus is talking about? First, 
let's identify a couple things. Number one, people who mourn are identified by God. The idea that people need to be comforted is due to the fact that something has come into the life of a person that is uncomfortable, and it is something that God sees. <clears throat> of course he sees, we might think, because he's God. Well, of course he sees. But if we really think about this and truly ponder what is being said for just 10 seconds, we can boil down something that is very meaningful and significant in the area of mourning for those who are believers in Jesus. And this is the step two for us in considering the beatitude. So here's a question that we can ask to help us concentrate our thinking toward a single point. The question is, what is it that makes us as Christians most uncomfortable in our relationship with God? What is it that causes us to be most uncomfortable in our relationship with God? Or what is it that would make us mourn before God? Do you have an answer? Well, one possible answer certainly is sin. Sin causes us to be uncomfortable in our relationship with God. Sin is the root of our uncomfortability with God, as a matter of fact. Sin causes loss, material things, uh, many other things. Sin causes pain. In God's heart, in our hearts, in, in our relationships with others, sin is constantly at the door. It is an affliction, the disease that every human suffers from. Sin causes mourning, or at least it should. Remember John Owen's statement that I started out with? I do not understand how a man can be a true believer in whom sin is not the greatest burden, sorrow, and trouble. Remember that? He's accurate in his thinking, at least, toward the Christian and the Christian's view of sin. It should cause mourning. Sin should cause us mourning. Sin is rebellion and opposition toward a perfect and holy God, and it should make us uncomfortable. And it should be looked upon, according to Jesus' teaching here in Matthew 5, 4, it should be looked upon as able to be, de able to be defeated. And you say, what? You might know that, but the beginning of the verse starts pretty heavy. Mourning. Blessed are those who mourn. People are going to be mourning. Someone is mourning. God sees those who mourn. This is weighty. I'm not sure where all we're going with this, but he certainly doesn't let us be in mourning for long. After an entire devotional so far with a heavy tone, we see hope. Jesus said, comfort comes to those who mourn. And yes, we can apply this to people who are mourning, having hope in Christ because of loss and pain. But certainly we could apply this to mourning of the believer over sin, having sorrow, deep sorrow, and repentant hearts over sin. We get this from the second phrase, for they shall be comforted. Would it not be accurate to say, when a Christian mourns over their sin, God comes in and comforts. The kind of mourning that is a mourning rooted in sorrowful, repentant, God-honoring hearts. There's a power in the second part of this phrase. And the power here is to Jesus' authority as he says this. This is remarkable for the Christian. This is true. And although we might know this, this verse and this set of verses in this passage, we might have read them and heard them and had them taught many times. There's something powerful here that we can't miss just because of our familiarity with the verse. Jesus didn't say, blessed are those who mourn, for they might be comforted. He said, they shall be comforted. It is a certainty. This must evoke a sense of hope in Christians. And where is our hope born? It's born in Jesus Christ. Comfort for mourning over sin will come. He said it would. Mourning over sin is something that we can be guaranteed to be hopeful in because of what Jesus has done with sin. Jesus actually said that those who mourn will be happy or blessed. And this is why it makes sense. When we mourn over our sin, God forgives us, therefore blessing begins to rise. When we're repentant and sorrowful for sin, when we have pain in our heart because we know we've pained God, that is where God will come and, and show comfort. Yes, I want you to feel bad for sin. This is a good thing. 
How can we be mourning and happy at the same time? Only when we're mourning over sin. Christ has the strength to overpower mourning and bring joy. Four examples that we see, four of many examples. One of them is 1 Peter 3, 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. Christ's work overpowers sin and brings us to God. This brings comfort. A second passage is 1 John 1, 9, very familiar. If we confess our sins, he is faith, faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us even from all unrighteousness. Christ's work results in our position being one to whom forgiveness is offered. This brings comfort. A third verse is 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Christ exhibits patience perfectly and experientially. This brings comfort. Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God did what he did while we were in the position deserving of his wrath. He stayed his wrath and he sent his son to die to take our penalty. Our penalty for sin, which is death and hell, separating us from God, has been paid. Christ did that. This brings comfort. The cross of Christ brings the comfort of Matthew 5, 4. One pastor has said of all this, Fill your affections with the cross of Christ and there, be, there may be no room for sin at all. When we see Jesus Christ and his work on the cross as really magnificent, when we invite God to give us a sight of Jesus again and again and again, and the reality of Jesus' self and the work of Jesus become bigger and more evident and more real to us, the more we see what it is that he has done, the more we see how big of a deal it is that our sin debt has been paid, and the more we see comfort comes because our sin is more revealed to us and we can confess it to him, and comfort comes because he blesses those who mourn with repentant hearts over sin. This verse in Matthew 5, 4, just like these other Beatitude verses, carry a lot of weight for such short verses. There's a lot, really, that's within them. Believe Jesus in this teaching and experience the comfort that comes in mourning over our sin. And while we're to mourn over sin, it is right to mourn over our sin. We must always remember that weeping may endure through the night, but joy comes in the morning, and I mean the daylight. God's desire for us is to be sorrowful for our sin. He convicts us so that we will feel sorrow and pain for our sin that nailed Jesus to the cross. That's a good thing. But the future he is interested in giving us ultimately is hope and joy in him because he's defeated sin, death, and hell. This is powerful. The person who understands evil in his own heart is the only person who is useful and fruitful and solid in his beliefs and obedience. As we find comfort and hope in Christ's work on the cross, even in our mourning being comforted because we know we've been forgiven because our hearts are repentant, there is where our beliefs start to take root in such a way that our actions begin to be lived out as not wanting to sin, killing sin, staying away from sin and pursuing lives that are not in opposition to God or purposefully cutting out things in life that may lead us to be opposing to God or rebellious against God. These are part of the blessings that come from hearts that mourn over sin. This is part of the comfort that comes with new desires as we mourn over our sin. What are we going to do to take away? Three things. Number one, be killing your sin or it'll be killing you. Again, this is a quote from John Owen, the man that I quoted at the beginning. Run and flee from thinking and actions which you know are God opposing. When we know something flat out is rebellious or opposing to God, just stop immediately. When you know, when you're cognizant of it, when the Spirit of God has let you see there's something that is not right before Him, don't play with that. Don't toy with it. Run from it. If you happen to engage it and the Spirit of God convicts you, thank Him for the conviction and begin to mourn what has happened as we've chosen uh, temporary pleasures over eternal pleasures in God. Let the mourning occur and know the comforts on the way. 
But before it even happens, be killing sin before it kills you. Second thing is keep a short sin account. When you're convicted of a matter in which you've sinned against God, and this matter is now known to you because of the conviction of the Spirit of God, confess it. When you have conviction, confess it. That morning begins and then comfort comes, but it doesn't start until confession happens. And confession is rooted in the prompting of the Spirit of God, showing us we've wronged God. Confess it. Keep those short sin accounts. My father taught me that when I was a kid. Um, this is important that we remember. When we've sinned and we're, we're aware of it, confess it. Start fresh. Keep the slate clean before the Lord. We know that God is faithful to forgive and cleanse. This keeps us comfortable in presence of God. And we keep a short sin account. Lastly, pursue a lifestyle which keeps you in the center of his promises. In other words, believe his word. Believe his promises. And you will experience his patience firsthand as God exhibits patience toward you. As he exhibits patience toward you when you're navigating through circumstances where temptation may come. He'll be patient. He's equipped you to battle temptation. In his patience, he'll wait and see and equip you and watch, knowing what's going to happen already. And when we fail, being ready to swoop in with conviction, which is a loving thing that he does. But at the, at, at the very least, pursuing a lifestyle which is seeking God's promises to believe over the temporary lies that seem like promises of the enemy. Seeking a lifestyle that keeps us in the center of his promises will keep us comfortable in relationship with him. His patience toward us is great. As Peter said, he is not slow in keeping his promise. He is patient. We must not waste this patience of God. Don't waste his being patient with you. Pursue a lifestyle living in his patient mercy by looking for promises that he's made. This is how we live as believers in ways that are most honoring to him. Looking for promises that God has made and believing them. And our believing them comes whenever we have chances to not believe them. And when we don't believe his promises, when we don't believe his way is better, then we sin against him. And then we need the conviction to come. But let's grow and be stronger in our faith in God and believe in his promises and pursue lifestyles which get away from opportunities where we don't believe him. Getting into opportunities to know more of his promises, to pit against the temptations that come. Pursue a lifestyle living in God's patient mercy as one who pursues the joy of experiencing his promises fulfilled. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted is a wonderful verse. There's a lot that carries in this verse. May it be a verse that you live by from this point forth on into your life, remembering that when mourning over sin is beginning to enter into our lives and in our heart sense, the comfort of the Spirit will come because God wants us to mourn over sin. Only then will we be pointed to be blessed and happy by his forgiving us in our repentant heart. So may we have this as a heart set as Tipton Baptist. I hope that you've enjoyed the uh, Matthew series so far over the past month and a half or so. We've been through a number of them. There's a few more we're going to do, and then we'll probably shift gears in our Bible study. But uh, I'm glad to be with you. Look forward to some point being with you in person in these moments. But in the meantime, stay in the Word, and we'll see you Sunday.